Sometimes we have trouble just staying with the line of Scripture. You know what I mean? If we go below the line, then we're subtracting from that which the Bible says, and that ultimately leads to liberalism, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, it's just by reality, that leads to liberalism taking away from what the Bible clearly teaches. But if we go above the line, then we're adding to what the Bible clearly teaches, and that ultimately leads to legalism. So you have liberalism below the line, legalism above the line, for example. We believe that Paul the Apostle was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write part of the New Testament. And you'll recall that in 2 Timothy 3, 16, Paul writes, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So if someone claiming to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, comes alongside and says, well, the Bible is inspired, yes, but it's no more inspired than Shakespeare or Homer or Oprah or whomever. Well, that line of thinking leads to liberalism. Why? Because they're subtracting something from the biblical claim. And the Bible claims that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. But that's a different kind of inspiration than Homer or Shakespeare or Oprah. Kind of like when Thomas Jefferson literally took a copy of the New Testament and cut out all of the miracles. He said he didn't believe them, so he tried to cut them out. Whether he believed them and whether he cut those out physically from the pages of the text does not negate the reality that they happened and that the Word of God is, in fact, true. So we know that Jesus rose from, dead on, rose from the dead on Sunday, the first day of the week. The early church began to celebrate his resurrection then on Sunday. It has become like a Christian Sabbath in the sense that typically we worship now on Sundays living with the recognition that that was the first day of the week in which Christ arose. So we do that on Sunday, not Saturday. So if somebody says, well, on Sunday you can't watch a ball game or you can't play catch, or you can't cut your grass, that's legalism. Why? Because they're adding to what the Bible teaches. So you see the two extremes, liberalism that subtracts, legalism that adds to. What I'm saying to us is we need to hold the line when it comes to Scripture. The great American evangelist Peter Cartwright is known for losing the U.S. Congress seat to Abraham Lincoln. And Cartwright was a Methodist circuit rider which meant that he rode a horse from town to town and preached the gospel in these various communities in the Old West. He was a rugged man. He had a very effective ministry. He baptized some 12,000 people through the course of his ministry. But like all of us, he too had a proclivity toward wrong ideas and sometimes wrong actions. As the story goes, one day after Cartwright had preached, a man came up to him to test his sincerity. The man struck the preacher on the right cheek and then struck him again on the left cheek. You've read that biblical text, right? Through both blows, Peter Cartwright stood his ground, didn't flinch, no retaliation. But then the man struck him a third time and the preacher landed a nice uppercut on the man's jaw. And just as the blow landed, he said, my Lord said nothing about a third slap, brother. Now, that's an example of a misapplication related to the intention of the biblical text, and it happens all the time. It happens related to a lot of subjects, and it certainly happens related to the subject for today's sermon. It's always important that we understand what the Bible is seeking to instill within us, and then that we guard against adding to or taking away from it. This is especially the case regarding the subject for today. I'm going to talk to you in just a moment about divorce. Think with me about how this conversation goes. He said, she's not as interested in sex as I am. I need somebody who can meet all of my needs. She said, he doesn't show me tenderness like I need. I need somebody who would plan a date for me or take me out to dinner and the movie, he's stuck in a rut. He just doesn't understand me. He said, I can't believe she gained 10 pounds. She doesn't look like that model I married 20 years ago. 
She said all he ever wants to do is hang out with his buddies and work on those old stupid cars. I think he'd pay attention to me if I had fenders. He said, I gave her a really nice vacuum cleaner for our anniversary. What more could a woman want? And she said, I'm sick and tired of feeling invisible. I want out. He said, she said, but what did Jesus say? So that's what we're going to talk about. He said, she said, Jesus said. From Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 21 or verse 31, I invite you to stand as we read together. Matthew 5, verse 31, a brief biblical text. Jesus is speaking, and this is what he says. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, we could spend all morning talking about what's been said, what's being said, what needs to be said, and also what Jesus said, but let's narrow the focus to what Jesus actually said. While the foundation of civilized culture is being challenged, and you know this is happening with all that's going on related to marriage and the debate about what marriage actually is, while the foundation of our culture is being challenged by a whole new ethic, the church in America, my brothers and sisters, had better stop fussing over tertiary trivialities and stand strong on gospel ground. While churches are debating whether or not a pastor should wear a tie or has to use a pulpit, the very foundation upon which our nation has been built is crumbling. It's time we, as the people of God, get it together. With our Bibles open, we need to point out the prospect of divorce, the parameters of divorce, the pain of divorce, the plan to avoid divorce, and the pardon post-divorce. As is the case each week, this is going to be a biblical lesson, but let me take a moment and encourage you to breathe, okay? There is grace available to each of us in the midst of all that I'm going to say. So let's dig in. Number one, I want you to recognize the prospect of divorce. Verse 31, Jesus said, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Jesus readily admits that divorce will occur. We know that's a reality. Jesus knew it was a reality in his day and time as well. But I want you to know there's a difference in recognizing something is and advocating for something to be. For example, people say, and they've said this to me for years off and on, people say all the time, the Bible is pro-slavery. Haven't you read the Bible, Ken? You're a Christian. The Bible is pro-slavery. Why would you believe a book that is pro-slavery? Listen to me carefully. The Bible simply talks about slavery, but it doesn't in any way advocate slavery. Just because Jesus talks about divorce and even made clear allowances for it, it doesn't mean he's advocating it. And just because we know that divorce involves sin, it doesn't make it, let me be clear, and this is where I want you to breathe, it doesn't make it the unpardonable sin. In first century times, within Greco-Roman circles, a man could divorce his wife very, very easily. In fact, there was not even, I'm told, a legal or formal procedure. He could just write her a certificate of divorce, about which Jesus is speaking here. Or, get this, he could simply turn to his wife and say, I'm tired of you, and that's that. Divorce was, believe it or not, more common back then than it is even today in American culture. Granted, having said that, in Jewish circles, there was a higher view of marriage due to the giving of God's law related to marriage and certainly related to divorce. Deuteronomy 24.1 makes clear that divorce would be permitted only if a man found something indecent about his wife. The problem is in that phrase, some indecency. The problem is that phrase, some indecency, soon became somewhat of a blanket kind of catch-all statement that would allow a man to say he's found some indecency in his wife and then he would move on legally and otherwise. In fact, the religious elitists of the day 
made that phrase, some indecency, a wide catch-all clause. So literally, as you've likely heard before, and this is exactly true, a man could divorce his wife because she burned his toast. Let that sink in for just a moment. So then what happened? There would be thousands of poor women being crushed by these very liberal, subtracting from, very liberal divorce laws. And then the men who were considering themselves to be outwardly righteous, they're very smug, they would divorce their wives, they gave her a certificate of divorce, so they felt like they were free to marry again. The certificate of divorce at least gave the woman the right to remarry. But here's what was going on with the religiously elite men of the day. They were just, in essence, hopping from bed to bed, from partner to partner, but doing it in such a way that they felt like it was legal. Therefore, in his mind and the mind of other religious elitists, he was still acting righteously. Now, don't advocate that way in a thunderstorm. Our culture today denigrates the sanctity of marriage in some ways much like the ancient culture did but we do it by seeking nowadays to redefine it and even there are people who claim to be bible believing followers of christ that now are saying marriage is something that and and let me be clear here something that god has very clearly very succinctly said it is not there are people seeking to redefine marriage Have you ever heard anything more ridiculous about marriage in your life than what is going on in today's culture? Our culture denigrates the sanctity of marriage, trying to redefine it. Some, even in the church, trying to redefine it. Protestants denigrate the sanctity of marriage by the acceptance of homosexual unions. Protestants denigrate the sanctity of marriage by the acceptance of serial monogamy. Our Catholic friends denigrate the sanctity of marriage through annulment, saying that a marriage was simply invalidly contracted. Now, granted, there may be cases where this is true, but they are much rarer than is the common practice. Jesus then comes along in the midst of his culture, and we recognize, as we've been studying through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is continually raising the standard. You have heard it said, but, he says, I now say to you. So he is, con- he is always raising the standard. Remember what's happening. He comes back and says, you've heard this said, but I say to you. Each time he raises the standard, he is doing what? He is trying to move people toward this more perfect love. The six Old Testament commands, which are now recapitulated by Jesus on murder, adultery, divorce, vows, retaliation, and love of neighbor, literally put on this perfect love about which Jesus is speaking. Here again, he is raising the standard. So Jesus is going to deal with what has been said, but he is going to clarify by what he is now saying. And contrary to revisionist historians, what Jesus says about something really is the last word. So the prospect of divorce, Jesus knew it would happen. We know it will happen Number two, the parameters of divorce, verse 32. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, I know those are very strong and very harsh words that we need to understand. So let's talk about the parameters of divorce. The Bible does not embrace no-fault, easy dissolution of marriage. Sexual immorality... Pornia in Greek can refer to adultery, prostitution, incest, fornication, bestiality, or homosexuality. There's a debate today as an example about whether or not pornography fits the description of sexual immorality to the degree that it should be just cause for divorce. And I confess to you, I'm not there yet in my own understanding. Not because in any way I would seek to justify the use of pornography, but because while there is a visual component to the act, there's not the same physical component as in skin on skin at the risk of sounding crude with another human being. So I say that Christian ethicists will continue the debate and offer more insight in the future as to how we're to understand this particular sin, but suffice it to say, it is unbelievably damaging 
to any relationship. So there are acceptable reasons for divorce. We know a lot of people in our culture who are divorcing without just cause, and they say things like this, we just don't get along perfectly. Now don't nudge your spouse at this point, that wouldn't be prudent. We don't get along. Does anybody get along perfectly all of the time? If you do, you're breaking, or if you say you do, you're breaking another commandment because you just lied in church. And while still maintaining a posture of grace, what I'm saying to us is the church needs to make it clear that divorce is a last resort and only for certain situations. Here, Jesus makes it clear that immorality on the part of a spouse is grounds for divorce. The covenant has already been broken, and divorce in that sense is simply a legal recognition of that which has already occurred. It is permissible to divorce. But even though you can, you don't have to. There are a lot of couples that go through the pain of infidelity that choose to stay together. Repentance is a part of that entire process, and they make it work by the grace of God. Paul will also speak of abandonment as grounds for divorce in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And frankly, without boring you with my argument, I would place abuse in the category of abandonment, and I can give you all kinds of great hoops that I can jump through to do that, but I would say I would do that if for no other reason than the abusing spouse is forsaking the marriage covenant, abandoning his spouse by abusing his spouse. We can talk about that over coffee sometime if you'd like, but I'll win. <laughs> so the prospect of divorce, the parameters of divorce, thirdly, I want you to recognize, and I know this is hard, but the pain of divorce. Divorce always involves hurting people, both in the sense of people hurting other people and people who are simply hurting, being hurt. Those of you who have either been divorced or had divor divorce occur to someone you're close to know all too well the pain that this causes. I've thought a lot about this in recent years. One, one of my relatives is, has been in this situation off and on, but it is so hard to raise children with two parents. I cannot imagine the dedication and the patience that it takes to be a single parent. So those of you that fit into that category, I want you to know, God bless you. We can, I cannot imagine the extra challenges and difficulties that you face. So there's no condemnation on our part simply blessing and encouragement and, and really an offer to come alongside as a church body and say, what can we do to help? What can we do to be Jesus for you and for your children? We probably ought to say amen because some people might need to hear that. In marriage, two become one. In divorce, one becomes two. And regardless of the circumstances, there's never a clean break. Let's look at it this way for a moment. Think about taking two pieces of paper and gluing them together and pressing that paper down on the other paper, letting that settle and sit and dry. The two become one. But then, regardless of the circumstances of how it comes about, when divorce occurs, if we try to separate those two pieces of paper, that one piece of paper into two pieces, it will never be a clean tear or a clean break. It will always be painful. And those of you that have been through that know that. And that's why as the church family, we need to try to do what we can to put salve in the wounds of those who have experienced it, but also do all that we can to help those who are married to avoid divorce, if at all possible. So regardless of why divorce occurred, I want you to hear me very clearly, it is not the unpardonable sin. It's not. Even if a marriage begins in adultery because one partner previously divorced a spouse without biblical grounds, it doesn't constitute adultery for the duration of the marriage. It does need to be confessed and repentance needs to take place, but then move on. You cannot unscramble eggs. We need to stress as a church the sanctity of marriage 
but if divorce has occurred, let's put salve in people's wounds and get on with the process of healing. That's where grace enters. People who divorce know there's sin involved, whether it's their sin or their spouse's sin or a combination. They know there's sin involved. Somebody has sinned and sinned long enough or continually enough for things to get to the point where two people who have become one person or one unit will now once again become two. It's divisive. It's painful. So what I want us to understand is divorced people don't need us to tell them there's sin involved. They do need us to tell them there's grace available. So the prospect of divorce, parameters of divorce, the pain of divorce. But let's talk for just a moment about the plan to avoid divorce. Now hear me very clearly, in no way am I simplistic enough to think that all divorce is avoidable. So don't, I'm, I'm not speaking down to anybody. Don't take it that way. But when, when preachers in particular, people in, in my world, point out the problems, it always bugs me when we don't talk about the solutions. So let's talk about a plan to help people avoid this. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians. And this is probably familiar territory to most. Ephesians chapter 5. And I want us to begin with verse 21. And I know that most translations, that's going to be right in the middle of a sentence. But just work with me on that. Verse 21. Paul has written this. And this is what he says in verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 22. Wives. Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, that's a, that entire text is a sermon for another day. Let me clear up a couple of things. Each partner, and we get this from verse 21, each partner needs to submit to Jesus Christ in order to experience family harmony. The husband submits to Jesus, the wife submits to Jesus. And on the part of the wife submitting to her husband, let me be very clear, this is not some kind of old school ogre speech. This is not saying that you're supposed to go along with everything that your husband wants you to do or not do. This is not blind submission, nor is it submission to things that are against the will of God. There are all kinds of things that would fall into that category. What we need to understand from this text is that genders are equal in God's sight. It is simply the way God ordered the household to be established. There is to be mutual submission to Christ, and it is in deference to the ultimate leadership of the husband to maintain the health of the marriage. It gives great responsibility, however, to both parties. There's a domino effect. If a man doesn't love his wife as Christ loved the church, submission is in jeopardy. When submission is in jeopardy, harmony is in jeopardy. When harmony is in jeopardy, society is in jeopardy. So we are to mutually submit to Christ. And what I would say to us is the church needs to do all that it can to help couples avoid divorce. Now, how can we do that? Well, one of the ways that we do that, and it's a requirement for people that get married here, is through premarital counseling. And I'll tell you, I talk about everything I can think of and then some things. We talk about communication. We talk about sex. We talk about finances. We talk about in-laws. You know the difference between in-laws and outlaws? Yeah, outlaws are wanted. <laughs> we talk about all that we can talk about to help prepare them. Now, that's not a, a lot of, there are people here that have been through premarital counseling and the marriage ended in divorce. It's not, it's not a safety net completely, but it helps. 
Also, I make our church's ministry available to a couple wherever they happen to live after they've become husband and wife. And I encourage them, I say, call me anytime you get into a rough patch and you need somebody to talk to, I want to help you and talk you through that. We offer ongoing counseling and support, and we ought to do that from the whole church. We need some more established couples mentoring younger couples, especially those who are new in marriage. Help couples learn to disagree, but they learn to do that within certain parameters. Teach them you can differ and you can debate, and in fact, the reality is there will be times that you'll argue, but you do that all within the parameter of we're not going anywhere. We're staying together. And we need to teach couples how to do that. Then we need to be lauding the permanence and the beauty of marriage. Model in front of one another how we're to cherish our spouse. Model and teach how to avoid risky behavior. For example, we say to people all the time, and it happens all the time, that couples should avoid living together before marriage because statistically speaking, Living together before marriage is a precursor to divorce. It often is a predictor that that will be the reality. That's a risky behavior besides the fact that it's not biblical. It is adultery. It ought not to be done. We also talk about the risk of utilizing or using alcohol and all that that can bring into a relationship. There are a lot of marriages that end in divorce, and that can be traced back to the use of alcohol. Even those who seek to do that in their word, responsibly. Drugs, same thing. Pornography often plays into marital, to, marital difficulties. So we need to talk about these kinds of risky behaviors and give a warning to couples. And then we want to help couples understand difficult times will come. Some of you remember the very first sort of big argument you had with your spouse and you thought, this is it. I guess it's over. I can't believe we've gotten to this place. We need to help couples understand they're not alone. And then finally, I want us to recognize the pardon post-divorce. I know that within this room this morning and in our venue service as well, there are a lot of people that have been through the painful situation of divorce. And we don't want to do anything or say anything that would in any way bring more hurt into the hurt that they've already experienced. So I want you to know about the pardon post-divorce. Romans 8.1, let's say this together. I think it's going to be on the screen. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Say no, no. Condemnation. condemnation. Think about that with me. This includes everybody who has repented of whatever their sin may have been. We're talking about thieves, drunks, drug addicts, homosexuals, adulterers, and certainly those who have been through the trauma of divorce, whether they were the offending party or the offended party. When we come to Jesus in repentance and faith, hear me very clearly, there is no, no, no condemnation. And if Jesus says, through Paul, there's no condemnation, let me tell you something, folks, we should never be a part of a church that wants to say more about something than Jesus said or than the Word of God said. No condemnation. I can't stress how vitally important it is that the church be on the right side of standing for the sanctity of marriage, but then also offering redemption when divorce happens. Now, I've told this story before, but I made it a vow early in my ministry that I would tell it often because it so powerfully illustrates the difference one church can make in helping or hurting those who have been divorced. A young man married his sweetheart, they were both Christians. They were both active in the church. In time, they had a son. Whether it was immaturity or financial strains or the fact that he was away from her serving his country for a time, things between them became difficult, and in time she left. But a little later, she came home, and they sought to try it again, but it didn't work out. She left again and filed for divorce. After struggling mightily to come to grips with this new part of his life, the change that this brought about in his life, this young man, on his own, rededicated his life to Christ. He was a member of a Southern Baptist church, and he went to his pastor and he said, Pastor, I've been through a lot, and you know that, and I want to use my pain to help somebody else. 
And the pastor said, I'm sorry, son, but we don't have a place here for people like you. And he went home and he ingested poison and he died. And I never knew my uncle, Wallace Ellis, because one preacher in one church did not have the spiritual fortitude to extend grace to someone who was crushed by the tragedy of divorce. It may be divorce, it may be adultery, it may be drunkenness, homosexuality, cheating, stealing, pornography, you name it. Hear me clearly. If you confess and repent, in Jesus' name, literally, God is my witness, I want you to know you're clean. You're clean and you're